Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Uh, I'm back after a bit of a hiatus and who better to have that first episode with than Martin. So welcome back, Martin. How are you? Yeah, pretty good and uh, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, had a bit of a break and geez, what a, what a time to be alive as always. It feels like every month we have more interesting things to talk about, but some of the stuff we're going to go through today, it really is, um, you know, extremes in terms of some of the data that we're now getting since the GFC and all-time highs or low. So looking forward to going over all of that. But any general comments from you, Martin? Well, I think two points. The first is the concept of compression. Things are happening much more quickly than, than perhaps people are used to, right? So events that might have taken months to play out are taking weeks or days to play out, firstly. And secondly, the extremes, the silliness, the uh, you know departure from fundamental value is probably more extreme than it's ever been. Uh, of course, linked to silliness from federal uh, Federal Reserve and uh, other central banks, and uh, yeah, so there's nuts wherever you look, right? And um, trying to separate the noise from reality is really the challenge. Yeah, and I think um, I mean even you'd agree that uh, the crypto side of things is coming more and more into the mainstream conversation these days. Uh, and it's almost like what would be the alternative here if we didn't have cryptocurrencies because there's all these other conversations going on around precious metals at the moment and whatnot. But I think with everything going on, it, it's actually such an important outlet that people have this other option. And we've seen El Salvador. We might touch on that later. Um, at the same time, we're seeing those with power in the US cracking down on crypto and coming out with the old misinformation oh they use too much energy oh they're used for crime blah 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 and we knew that this was all going to happen but any thoughts on that well the critical question for me alex is this where is the final point of value right that's really the key question now we've got to ask right because you know is it the us dollar because of course the us dollar is basically being devalued because of all the stuff that's being printed right is it Precious metals, well, if you look at the track of precious metals, it really hasn't done much. Or is it something else, right? Because at the moment, what we're doing is we're comparing relative movements based on um, a, a fuzzy foundation, right? So for me, the real question is, where is the fundamental point of value? Mm, exactly. What is anything worth in this world that's going digital and so much intangible wealth and, and whatnot? So, yeah, yeah, great, great question. I know you love your philosophy. Mark. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into these awesome slides you've got prepared for us. So this is a crazy, crazy number. 5% in, in is that annualized or is that in a month? It's basically uh, effectively um, uh, from the prior year. So it's percentage change from the prior year, right? So 5%. Yeah. 12 months a day. Okay, so yeah. 5%, the cost of living doesn't sound much, but you know, you start to add that up year by year. And in most countries, we're not getting wage increases. And mm. most people or businesses don't have even you know 5% margins. People are getting a 5% uh, wage increase and the cost of food is arguably going up far more than that as we've both spoken about on our channel. So what are your thoughts on all this, Martin? Well, it's very interesting because that 5%, of course, um, is taking account of what's called the base effect. So we had a very significant drop a year ago and, of course, we're moving from a low base. So that's the first point. The second is if you look at the components within the overall US CPI number, in fact, food hardly went out of all. It was 0.4%, uh, right? Very, very, very small. But things like secondhand cars way through the roof right and if you look over the last year the cost of fuel has gone up more than 50 percent although it didn't move much this last month so there's a lot of noise in these numbers and uh, so it really takes you to the fundamental question as to you know is this meaningful at all or is it really just uh you know noise in the system because of the base effect and because of these one-off things right and that's really the question that most people are now wrestling with right how real is this how long term is it is it structural inflation or is it simply, um, you know, just coming through and it will wash out the system? I mean, Jerome Powell talks about transitory, you know, it's going to settle down. It's going to be, uh, you know, within their 2 to 3% band, maybe, or maybe below. Um, that's the unknown quantity. The other point, it goes, it goes back to what do you compare it with, right? That's the, the value anchor question, right? What, what are you comparing it against, right? Because, you know, if you are actually taking the argument that, well, maybe there's more dollars in the system than there were a year ago, right? Um, how does that translate to the value of what you've spent? Uh, so it's a really complex thing. So my view is I'm not over anxious by these numbers. I think a lot of it's explained by the base effects and one-off effects. 
we've got to wait and see whether inflation really does come through or whether like central banks believe it's going to calm down again. Yeah, as you say, if that basket basket of goods is nothing else changes, all else remains equal, but the US have printed 25 to 30 percent more uh, base currency or M2 last year, you'd be surprised if the cost of that basket hadn't gone up somewhat. But the question is, well, how much? Because a lot of that 25 percent increase is sitting in the bank's coffers just as reserves. It hasn't been lent into existence yet. Um, And it is it's scary how slow the central bankers are to react, let alone government policymakers. If there are these big changes, it's too late before they even act. So they can say transitory all they want, but it's the people that feel it at the hip pocket straight away. And the point is, of course, they've changed their policy, right? Because previously, central banks were trying to predict future inflation. And so they would try and change their monetary stance before it actually emerged. Now they're saying, well, we're going to wait for it to appear and then we're going to react. Now, that there is a really big chance now of what I call a policy misstep. In other words, they miss it, right? And so suddenly they'd let the genie out the bottle and inflation is hard to control. We saw that in the 70s and the 80s. So what they're doing is potentially setting themselves up for some risks if this actually doesn't play out the way they think. And, you know, we've never been here before with the amount of stimulus that's in the system. Low interest rates is deflationary. Quantitative easing is not necessarily inflationary. It depends where the money goes. But there are just so many moving parts to this that I'm not sure that any central bankers really have got their uh, their, their act together and really understand what's going on. It's a big experiment, Alex. Yeah, you're on the deflation side, though, generally, aren't you, Martin? Because what you just said then isn't the mainstream view that low interest rates are deflationary. The mainstream view for economics is that it's the other way around, isn't it? Drop interest rates to get more inflation. Well, except that if you watch where the money is actually going, it's not necessarily going back into the real economy, right? So yeah. if, if it sits in the financial system or if it sits um, in, in asset prices, that's one type of inflation. But look at, look for real wages growth, right? That For me, it's real wages go, growth that will be the signal if inflation is really is really moving forward, right? I don't see much evidence of that yet. And of course, in Australia, real wages growth uh, is nowhere. It's been nowhere since 2011. And of course, in the public sector, there's a wages freeze at the moment. In the private sector, the Reserve Bank is saying, wouldn't it be nice if people got a pay rise? But they're saying it's probably not going to happen until 2024. So look, for me, that's going to be the critical lever, right? If we see wages really start taking off, that will be the sign of this is structural inflation. Without it, um, it could be transitory. Can you explain the public freeze? I wasn't aware that that because normally the public sector has their wages go up in line with CPI. Right? Yeah, well, I believe I believe that they've actually um, pushed it out a bit and said, well, you know, given everything else, COVID, et cetera, et cetera we'll just hold, hold things at the moment. Um, that's okay. the I heard that uh, from a couple of sources the other day. So uh, I think that's what's okay. happening. Alrighty, next slide. We've got the old what we're just talking about: inflation versus deflation <laughs> argument. And yeah, some of the, go oh, on. You're right. Yeah, I was just interesting that there was a Deutsche Bank report that came out this last week on this whole question: deflation, inflation. They're arguing this is probably the most critical forty over the last forty years, the most critical decisions that we're taking now than we've ever had. And they quoted Ronald Reagan, who said back in. 1978, that inflation is as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber, and as deadly as a hitman, right? So they were really scared of inflation back then. And yet Biden said in 2021, a job is about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about dignity. It's about respect. In other words, they've shifted the dial now to talk about, you know, so social impact, right, rather than just the, the inflationary stuff. Yeah, then, of course, said, um, you know, Low rate interest rates gives us opportunity to do, to do stuff again. That's, that's social. And, and um, Larry Summers said, um, "I think this is the least responsible macroeconomic policies in the last forty years." <laughs> right? And then, of course, you got Powell saying, uh, "This is just a, in reopening. You're going to get these wobbles. There's nothing serious." Right? So, I mean, it's it's really just interesting seeing those sort of themes coming through. So, what the Deutsche Bank report said was, "Look, this is probably the most critical question that we've got." It's too soon to say whether it's real or whether it's just, um, you know, this wobbly stuff coming through the system because we're recovering out of COVID. But the risks are that the policy settings will be wrong. And if they are wrong, the consequences will be fundamental. So I think that just scores 
underscores again how critical these debates are and how you know important issues are and of course it's critical for policy um, not only at the sort of the macro level but policies relating to individual portfolios right because if you believe that inflation is either raging now because of it's being mismeasured or it's coming through then you'd want to set your your portfolios one way whereas if in fact it's deflationary and we're asked this is just temporary and we're going to go through another you know downturn ahead then you want to position differently so it becomes really important not just at the macro level but you know, on individual investments as well. Yeah, and to add a, another quote into that mix, I think it was Christine Lagarde recently um, at the ECB talking about moving these goalposts from what they used to have in terms of the CPI band and their targets to now talking about unemployment rates. And when the Fed yep. hit those unemployment rates, they then move the goalposts again. And recently she said something along the lines of, I believe it was her, it might have been someone else, but basically, look, do you want inflation or do you want a job? And kind of yep. saying, stop complaining, you know, if we weren't doing this, unemployment would be higher. But I think it really just is focusing on the short term once again, because maybe this is going to cause far bigger problem when we have to have a new monetary system altogether because they've taken things too far. Yeah, and of course the Reserve Bank in Australia basically said the other the other week that um, for them keeping rates lower for longer was there to get the unemployment rate down and the job rate up. So their focus is exactly the same. It's about jobs, right? Never mind the financial consequences. And they recognise that low interest rates had a completely distortionary effect. So savers were being hit over the, the head by a four by two. Um, you know, people with loans were doing very well and borrowing more money, but they were f happy to wear that because their real focus now is the unemployment number. I think it's an excuse, frankly. Um, to my mind, you should be able to do both. It shouldn't be an either or. Yeah, I love the the headline in the AFR recently where the RBA was worried about the number of people that were saving money, worried about the level <laughs> of savings. You know, know. We I wouldn't know. want people being responsible or saving up till they can afford something. You know. It's really weird, isn't it? The concept that you actually save for it first and then buy it rather than actually get it on credit. I mean, of course, the, the, the banking system relies on credit, right? So they want you to borrow more for longer, right? They want you to be a cash flow into your old age and beyond, right? That's what they want. Um, that is the, that, that's the big trap. So the question is, you've got to make your own decisions about what's affordable and what's, what's uh, appropriate for you. Don't rely on just being able to get more and more credit to see you through. Because at the end of the day, you've still got to pay it back. Yeah, and that all changes as well, that whole argument and thinking if we do start to get inflation, if people yep. do say, well, things are going to get far more expensive the longer I leave it, then people are going to start to rush and they will spend those savings. And the scary thing is that is the mindset of these central bankers and they're going to keep taking things down that path. And, of course, inflation has another benefit to central banks. It reduces the absolute value of the debt, yes, right? No so it term. makes it easier to repay over the medium to long term. So there is a, you know, almost a year you want rates really low, but then you want rates really a bit higher because that will actually help with the longer term issues. So it's short term, long term, rates up range. That's why this is such a complex situation that we're looking at. And it's the first time in 10 plus years since the GFC when we really have had a lot of talk um, of inflation. And mm. it's always been a bit of a fear in the background, but this is the first time we're really starting to see it in the real world. Yeah, and I, I, I simply say at this stage, it's too soon to say, but watch the signs and, uh, you know, the other ob ob observations we'll see in a second is that maybe central banks will start tapering, will start turning back the stimulus because they start to get a bit worried about this. And in fact, it's interesting that the uh, official position was that the Fed wasn't talking about talking about tapering, right? In other words, taking some of the queue out. In fact, the minutes that came out last time indicated they had been talking about it. And I think they're going to use Janet Yellen as almost the talking about the Fed's <laughs> talking about talking about. So she'll exactly. be the first in, the, in the puzzle. But uh, you've got the chart here, Martin, of these shipping costs. Yeah, uh, and just, and just, just it's worth just bearing down. But this is a very good example of, you know, costs in the system going through the roof because, of course, now there's much more need to shift uh, goods around, containers are out of position, uh, all of those things, and um, uh, it's more expensive than it was. And in fact, those costs are huge. So it, there is definitely in that category significant inflationary pressures now moving stuff around. 
yeah, coming out of that um, that COVID period as well, there's always going to be a little bit of a bounce back, but it's so aggressive now. It's almost like China's stockpiling, uh, other people stockpiling. Uh, is there a shortage of goods being produced because places that are still in lockdown and, you know, the breaks we've got in supply chain. So all these these questions we had are starting to filter through and seeing these really high costs with people that are the only way to get from A to B know that they can charge more. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, there's also the chip shortages and everything else. So not only have you got shipping, but you've got other shortages as well. And the next slide's a good example, timber, right? Lumber, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so trying to get lumber for construction is, is quite tough at the moment. But it's interesting that the lumber futures, which went very high um, in the US, have come back, right? And that might be an example of when prices go high, more timbers cut, and it comes into the supply chain and therefore the future prices start to go down. So that's an example which could be transitory, right? But it's creating huge issues for anybody with a building contract, um, particularly if it's not fixed price, because suddenly the builders are going to say, well, I'm going to have to pay a lot more to get my timber to be able to build your house. And that, of uh, course, can flow into higher prices. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're a tradie, like, share some of your stories below because we're hearing all sorts of things where some are having to take a loss and they didn't realize this was in the contract or it wasn't. And then, you know, if you've if you've given a bit of a quote and it might have cost $40,000 for the timber for a house, you look at that chart, it's going from four hundred to $1,600. Well, that $40,000 is now $160,000. You know, that's a huge increase for the average family home. And people are going, well, I don't have an extra, you know, $120,000 um, for this house so it's causing those issues um, some of the, even the you know um, the people that are storing this timber are holding it back from the tradies even because they know that they can charge more or whatnot so lots of things happening in the real world yeah and in fact i made a post about four or five months ago with um, edwin almeida one of the people i have on my channel and he was talking then about the timber going and of course we've seen it disappear from bunnings you know it's hard to get any timber at all at the moment so now this is a real issue and i would make the point that many people when they signed up to have their house built didn't actually have a fixed price contract right mm. so effectively the you might be thinking your property is going to be costing x to complete but it might be x plus quite a lot yeah yeah timber yards is that the word i was looking for martin yeah it could be you can tell i don't go there very often can't you? <laughs> Will the Fed taper? So yeah. I think it was uh, maybe Canada that have been the first major central bank to even dip their toe in the water. Um, yep. The ECB uh, have increased, I think, their program just recently. Correct. But any signs we've ever had of tapering and cutting back, the market's always had a tantrum and, and sold off and sort of held the central banks hostage. And so that's what we're sort of waiting for or expecting will happen if they do taper or talk about tapering. Well, the interesting thing is, and this was done quite quietly, they've actually announced the winding down of the secondary market corporate credit facility, which was one of the facilities they put in uh, at the start of the COVID crisis, right? So basically allowed them to intervene in the secondary market. So that is already being ratcheted down, right? I'm not sure how many people noticed this announcement because it was not sort of spread from the, the hilltops, right? But that could be a sign that they are beginning to turn the dial down a little. And... Uh, this one was one of, was it, I think, seven different programs they had, but secondary markets. So this is when the Fed were coming in and buying um, corporate bonds and junk bonds off yep. the market. Is that right? Correct. Exactly right. Yeah, they were buying pretty much anything that moved. So they basically turned it down. And they announced earlier on that it was, they were not going to buy any more new, but now it's officially being removed. So, you know, it's a small signal, but I, I was intrigued that hardly anybody noticed it. So that's in itself quite interesting. I'm just going to bring up um, the chart of the junk bond ETF, uh, and it's had a, no, it hasn't had a little dip. It's going for all-time highs, Martin. So I would have expected um, JNK and HYG, these high-yield corporate bond ETFs, to have sold off a little bit on this news, but um, no, apparently not. So <laughs> we'll, we'll push on. Uh, another wild ride. So AMC, meme stocks are all the rage. It's it's kind of come into the crypto world a little bit through Dogecoin, but I, I'm expecting to actually see that in the future, Martin, because there's all these um, stock apps, and I think we're going to start to see more and more of the, like crypto apps and retail are just obsessed with meme stocks, and I think they're going to get obsessed with uh, meme altcoins, and it's all just a bit of a bubble. Um, but what do you think about this, Martin? Well, I call it market silliness because, of course, there's no anchor of value to where AMC went, right? 
Uh, I mean, it's interesting. AMC basically launched, uh, issued some stocks, then issued some more stocks, right, to to take account of the huge upswing in their price. So they they made quite a lot of money in the process, right? And this is this is retail investors, you know, clubbing together and effectively all chasing down the, the stocks. And, and the point about the note here is there are now other mem stocks or meme stocks, right, that are actually now on the list, right? And and so people keep you know, spotting different ones. And you're right, you know, same with crypto, right? This is really interesting because what it means is that there's a new dynamic in the markets, right? Because effectively it means that um, if enough retail investors get together and push in a particular direction, they can actually, um, you know, move the market, right? And the other interesting factor here is that we've now got to the point where these moves are so big that they're actually directly impacting the ETFs, which are meant to be mirroring the index, Mm. Right. And so I think on one day, something like um, 5% moves on the ETFs were actually all AMC. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cra crazy times. And uh, the guys on Wall Street are sort of crying to regulators and saying, oh, you know, you can't let them do this. We need to create new rules or laws and stop retail from doing it. But I really think retail have got a fair bit of power here mm. and they're always going to find a way or they're going to try something different. And we know that Wall Street have had it so good, you know, basically making money for doing very little and playing these games. And you can put on a suit and, and tie and pretend that things are, are worth X or Y, but retail have kind of come in and shown you that anyone can believe that any stock is worth anything really. And like, who's who's to say they're wrong? All these short sellers and short, uh, short selling funds have blown up over the years. And I know some people hate short sellers in uh, maybe the precious metals markets, but in general, they do serve a purpose. If something is overvalued and someone can push the value down to what they believe is fair value, well, now we don't have that at all. So it's just a matter of well, how many people are, are pushing up, basically, unless people are going to sell and take profits. But so much of this machine is just money being fed into the market by speculators or into these retirement funds and there's not as much coming out. Now, that might change in future when we've got the baby boomers retiring in, in, in bigger numbers. So we're going to see more selling as people take profit. But in general, it's just how much money is going to be fed into this machine. Yeah, absolutely. And the AMC um, uh, um, executives put out an, a, a note saying, um, you know, people should be cautious about these prices because it's not sustainable based on our, you know, the performance of our business, right? And that that's a really interesting observation when they themselves say, well, this is silly. This is really silly. This is nothing to do with fundamental value. And yet, um, two points. One is people can trade volatility up and, and down, right? And there are a lot of people doing that. And two, it shows you how when enough people head in the same direction, right, and start pushing, it can have quite a big impact. And, uh, you know, the analogy I'm using here for stocks, I think is also true for crypto. Right. If enough of the you know ordinary people get more involved and more involved in the crypto area, then it's going to have a bigger and bigger impact on what's happening. And 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 all of these things suggest to me that some of the assumed mechanisms of both control and also um, of you know large banks being in control of everything and hedge funds being in control of everything actually may be coming to a bit of an end. And in fact, of course, some of the um, uh, the, the small investors uh, pushed. Um, so hard that the hedge funds lost, lost, lost a lot of money in the process. So it's really interesting times. Yeah. So you, you think about a couple of other aspects here. So um, algorithms have become something like, you know, 70, 80, 90% of actual trading volume. And so all of a sudden you've got these real people come back into the market and it might be very thinly traded markets. And even if there is a bit of volume, it's these, these algos. And so this real buying really upsets those algos. They haven't seen it before. Or when everyone's buying those call options and then the algos don't really know what to do on the actual underlying um, spot prices of the stock. So all these things are sort of upsetting the traditional guys that have had it so good. Uh, but another point that's very interesting here is we've seen a lot of insider selling. So they're kind of taking profits off the table at record highs, but they're also issuing a lot of corporate debt or yep. more shares like GameStop or AMC have been doing, for example. And that is something that people don't often think about in terms of uh, shares that have maybe acted as a decent store of value over the years. But if these companies are now saying, well, I'm just going to issue 10% more shares or 20% more shares, it's the same as printing more currency. And even a lot of cryptos have at least got the number of coins programmed. They can't just turn around and say, we're going to issue 20% more. Um, you can make more individual cryptocurrency, sure. But the individual projects, this is something that's very different where people 
I reckon no one would have any idea that they've just been diluted 10 or 20% if GameStop sell 10 or 20% more shares into the market because there's crazy levels of buying. So that's a big dilutionary effect as well. Yeah, and you, that, the whole concept of dilution is not one that many people understand, right? But basically, if you issue another 10% shares, then your share is now worth you know, 10% less, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, so the RBA supporting the financial system. What have they announced, Martin? A uh, hundred and something so, billion dollars. So there's two hundred billion, right, um, of 0.1 percent money going to the banks, right? And this term funding facility, the TFF, is going to end at the end of June. In fact, um, the Reserve Bank spoke about it this week, and they've shown that around, um, you know, 164 billion has been taken so far. The rest will be. Uh, the point I want to make is, and it's worth. If you've got the time, I made a show on this in detail because it's it's so important, right? This is how they are controlling interest rates, right? Because what they're doing is pushing really, really cheap money at the banks so the banks can lend. That means that their interest rates to consumers have been very cheap. So that's why the mortgage rates have been so low, right? And that's in addition, of course, to all of the other government money that's been thrown into support through COVID, right? This is an additional $200 billion, right? And, and they're controlling the three-year curve as well so basically out to three years rates are very low but what's now interesting is that the term funding facility will come to an end um, at the end of june and then the banks will have to find other sources of funding beyond that now the term funding facility will be there for three years but it'll be then be paid down and that means that the banks will need to actually go either to the international capital markets which they've been basically not having to do for some time which means they'll be paying higher rates or they'll have to actually pay more for deposits because deposits become more valuable. In fact, the mix of deposits have changed uh, to be much higher relative to bonds and other funding for most um, operators in Australia in the, in the banking sector. So the implication for this is really important because what it means is that we're going to see interest rates start to move up irrespective of what the Reserve Bank does with the cash rate. right? And we're already seeing it. So ANZ today announced that some of their mortgage rates were going up in some cases by 0.5%. We've seen other organisations like Westpac also move some of their fixed rates up as well. And so the question now becomes how much will rates be rising independent of what the Reserve Bank has done simply because the term funding facility is being turned off? Mm, and I think we should uh, wait and see how much they're going to raise their um, interest rates on our savings accounts and all that, Martin. I don't think they'll be in a rush to uh, raise those rates like always. Um, but this is the question for me is how much have they taken a leaf out of the American playbook where they've got all this extra money and they're not allowed to use that those funds specifically for speculating, but it's just robbing Peter to pay Paul. So if they had an extra ten million over there that they would have had to normally use for reserves or lending or whatnot, well maybe they have been speculating on Tesla and Apple stock and whatnot. And so you take away the punch bowl, are the Aussie banks gonna cry poor like the American banks have been? And the RBA, again, they're just going to have their hand force continually. Maybe we see the Aussie stock market sell off or the banks just talk about how they've got all these problems and they can't lend and interest rates are going to rise and blah, blah, blah. You know, we need your help. We need you to print more money and give us more money for free. So that's what I'm waiting to see if it plays out like. Yeah, and look, the $200 billion basically supported the bank's profits, right? Their margins were effectively higher than they would have been thanks to it, right? Now, of course, this time around, the bank profits increased quite significantly because they've all written down some of the very high levels of provisions they made previously. But I think we're going to see very interesting questions about mar margin compression ahead. And um, you're right, the pressure on the Reserve Bank to do more to support the banking system, right, which seems to be the one thing they want to protect and preserve above everything else, could actually have some unintended consequences. But for, for, for those with mortgages, right, the cheapest fixed rates have already gone, um, I think. And for those on variable rates, I wouldn't be surprised to see an out of cycle variable rate rise in the months ahead. One thing that we've also seen, I read an article, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but in America now, we've all this intangible um, wealth and these products that they just can't get enough of, uh, BlackRock are now buying more yep. houses than average Americans and they're buying entire suburbs coming in and bidding 20% above. And this has all been basically funded by, you know, the Fed is sponsoring BlackRock. Then they've got all these programs where the big banks can 
you know, give out money and those these investors come in and they borrow this money to speculate. They package up all these mortgages into mortgage-backed securities and CLOs and all these fancy derivatives. And so this effectively being funded by taxpayers who now can't afford houses because BlackRock want to create more ETFs or derivatives, but real people can't afford to live in a real home. Like this is the level of insanity. And it's probably going to happen to a similar degree in Australia where the RBA are going to have to come in and rescue these people that can't afford their mortgage when rates start to rise because the banks are rising, raising rates and whatnot. So most people have no idea that any of this is happening under the surface. No, no, that Wall Street Journal article about BlackRock created huge stirs in the US and you had the conservative quarter saying, well, you know, we should let the market be the market, right? Whereas other people were saying, hang on, this is crazy. If they are paying 20% over, over the odds, all you're doing is just inflating house prices further, creating more financial derivatives based off the back of it. And this is 2008 playing out all over again. And for me, this is a pretty shameful thing. I haven't yet seen any evidence of this happening in Australia. But folks, if you know different, let me know. Um, but I'm certainly on the lookout for it because it is going to be tempting. There's got one of those investment players, one of the hedge funds here will say, hang on a moment, I can get this really cheap money. I can go buy property. I can then basically create some instruments around that and make make a turn on it. That's what I think is likely to happen. So it could well be that that's one of the reasons why prices are rising, but I just don't have the evidence yet to support it. Yeah, no, in Australia, I think ethically, the most similar thing we've had is how all this lending is just going to housing rather than real businesses. It's yeah. kind of that first step of just how can we make more money through not doing anything, but the consequences of the real world is not what banking was meant to ever be about. So. No, no, no. Banking was meant to be allowing the real economy to actually you know, work, right? Not speculate in its own right. Unfortunately, all the evidence around the world, the ECB, for example, shows that in this low interest rate environment, when lending is not that profitable, banks speculate more. And so we have huge amounts of speculation, whether you look at the derivatives, whether you look at some of the other stuff that's going on. And uh, there are smart people uh, with maths uh, degrees plus all over the place trying to find other angles to play here to basically make a turn. This is not healthy. Simple answer, of course, would be to um, bring a financial transaction tax into bear. And uh, that would generate a huge amount of uh, revenue for real good purposes and would take a lot of the heat out of these financial processes that actually aren't really benefiting you know, the real economy and real people at all. But of course, nobody wants to touch that because that would be destroying the, um, the artifice of the financial system. Yes. Yeah. You're never going never gonna, to uh, take anything away from them. They have a tantrum. No, the 1% always win. All right, so consumers on the brink feeling the pinch. Yeah, so here it's this the, 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 the lockdown has had a big impact on consumers, right? And, and, you know, my surveys suggest that a lot of consumers have been starting to spend those savings that they made over the last year because they were sort of thinking that this was a little bit over. But there's been a bit of a change in the weather over the last couple of weeks with, with Melbourne. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out with consumers. Of course, the um, JobKeeper secret ended. Um, which means that now people are more on their own. And um, interestingly, as we'll come on to a second, it's had quite a profound impact already on, on some sectors. So I'm not necessarily calling it as uh, another disaster, but it's interesting that the momentum that was there has ebbed a bit because the virus is still not under control and people are a bit worried about what might be happening. And as you and I have said several times, you know, you cannot disconnect the virus and the complications around the virus from the overall economic activity and output, right? And of course, ScoMo recently uh, said again, they're not going to think about opening the borders for some time. Another, another, you know, rather negative nut, new p piece of news. So I think this has got quite a lot to play out even now. Because mm, it really was uh, booming business confidence and consumer confidence and had the sharp pullback now. Well, it's interesting, um, just on, on the consumer, if you look at the um, mortgage stress number, hardly any change this month, still quite high. Um, but that's because quite a few people were actually pulling money out of deposits that they'd saved previously to spend on stuff. But the rental stress went up by nearly 200,000 households. And that's because a lot of people suddenly found that those rental protections were removed. Many of them were given notice to quit. Others were given rental increases. So we're seeing rentals rise. And of course, we've still got the uncertain work that many people have with regard to the rental sector. So unfortunately, those in the rental sector now are very much exposed to what's going on at the moment. And I suspect this is not going to change anytime soon. 
Uh, and you have got the business uh, confidence yep. on the next slide for us. Here. Yeah, and the business stuff's amazing. So it's really, really gone through the roof, right? So businesses are now getting quite confident about what's going on. Um, interestingly, there's uh, rising costs leading to price pressures is coming through quite strongly. Um, and the business conditions people think is is pretty good. So interesting to how that plays out. Now, again, in my surveys, a lot of businesses are doing it quite well, but there are still segments that aren't. And interestingly, some of those are where the lockdowns are. Some of those are actually in the, um, you know, some of the retail sector is still doing it quite difficultly as well. And tourism is patchy, right? There are areas that are doing quite well now because people are going into state and, uh, you know, moving around the country. And in a way, with the borders shut, what it means is that some of those money, some of that money that consumers would have spent overseas is now being spent elsewhere in Australia. But it's not reaching all parts of the country. And I am seeing some segments uh, in some areas where you know the businesses are still struggling. So for me, the conditions are better, definitely, but um, still a long way to go. You know, when I saw that um, consumer confidence number turned down, I was expecting that for business as well. But that's mm. just a result of what we've spoken about. Businesses and CEOs know that they're just going to get flooded with money and they can borrow more and it's they're the wealthy they're the wealthy that have nothing to worry about their assets are all going up so yeah and uh, i'd say that this survey more reflects the big end of town the bigger businesses than it does the smes right my survey which is focused more in smes it's nowhere near as positive so small businesses are worried about um uh you know cash flow they're also worried about um, um issues to do with you know simple things like um uh, fraud. So, for example, the ACCC this week published information on the uh, latest scams and small businesses are being scammed left, right and centre with um, false invoices and uh, all those sorts of things. So there's a lot of noise in the system and a lot of small businesses are really, I think, still up against it. So I don't think that necessarily gets caught in the big surveys that uh, are published. Yeah, fair enough. So uh, iron ore is another one that's going up martin and this is one of our um key exports well it's critical right and what happens to the price of iron ore is, is 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 probably one of the big questions right if it stays where it is that's going to be a huge bonus to the economy because of course we export a lot of iron ore to china predominantly but a few other places too interestingly the um uh, the uh, the vale mines over in south america um have actually reported more problems with with more um i think dams again so their ability to sort of up their exports uh, might be um, uh, less than previously. We also know that uh, China's sort of been making noises about getting iron ore from elsewhere, but haven't really done much. They're also talking about recycling more uh, um, old iron ore and stuff that sort. But at the moment, um, you know, if things stay as strong as they are, this is a very important underpinning for the economy, of spe spe specifically Western Australia, which is very reliant on iron ore. If it drops back, then that will be another sign of uh, trouble ahead potentially. Yeah, I just quickly brought up um, the Vale chart that's absolutely cruising and uh, I'm assuming BHP and Rio are going to be doing it pretty well as well, which, yeah, they are. And I guess the ASX just in general, something we spoke about over the years, Martin, was when Australia go down this path of 0% interest rates um, and you know QE and whatnot, just expect the Aussie stock market to take off, and um, it definitely has as well. Yeah, and you know the uh, markets in the US are at an all-time high. We had an all-time high here last last week. Um, not surprising. All that all that low money, you know, all that cheap money is going somewhere. Um, does it reflect fundamental value? Is the question. Um, I still have my doubts, but uh, I've still had the view that we could well be um, sitting well above. Uh, you know, real value for some time, but at some point may come back, may not, but that depends on some of the iron ore questions, the virus questions, and some of the other things that we've been touching on. Mm. And I'm just the Aussie dollar as well, sort of just hovering a little bit under 80 cents, but I, I just wonder if that's going to cause more headaches for the RBA as well in future. Uh, well, it's certainly part of the, 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 the puzzle, of course, the, the fact that international uh, lending to the banks was down because of the term funding facility has alleviated some of the pressure and in fact the international debt that we've got is lower than it was so that's going to give the RBA some wriggle room but that may change going ahead so again a lot to, a lot of moving parts to think about okay so Bitcoin Martin <laughs> yeah uh, hey everyone at home I want you guys to know Martin out of this slide not me 
<laughs> yeah, no, I did because I thought it was quite interesting, right? I mean, obviously, Bitcoin has dropped from its high recently, right? But I am intrigued by El Salvador and now, you know, India talking about it, other countries essentially beginning to think about Bitcoin as something which should be part of their monetary system in complete opposition to where a lot of the central banks are, which is saying, no, 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 we can't have Bitcoin, it's too risky and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not trustworthy. We need to have our own um, central bank digital currency. And, and for me, this is the real nexus, right? How this is going to play out? Is it going to be Bitcoin or an, an, another crypto or is it going to be a central bank digital currency? This is the real question of the moment now. Central banks are testing different forms of central bank digital currency. In China, of course, they're a long way ahead. But the fact that India may be thinking of um, you know, Bitcoin as an asset and El Salvador actually saying, well, alongside the Aussie dollar, we're going to be able to use Bitcoin and all the shops should be able to accept Bitcoin. I think it's a really interesting thing. Yeah. So on Twitter the other day, it, it was a live video chat that anyone could join. And there was the president of El Salvador while they were doing the vote. And it felt like it was a historic moment when mm -hmm. they're saying, we're going to create a like a crypto wallet that everyone can use or you can create your own. They're looking at this as a really open system. Whereas the US, I've got a few quotes here, Martin, from a research that I was going to do for another video because we saw the US um, policymakers come out straight away. And just yep. some of these videos they put out would... I was nearly pulling my hair out with this misinformation saying crypto is dangerous to the economy. Um, creating new cryptocurrencies uses a lot of energy, which is completely untrue. Um, more, it uses more energy than all the data centers on the world. She said one Bitcoin transaction uses more energy than a US household does in a month, which is, again, just completely untrue. And then they're talking about, oh, well, central bank digital currencies don't use as much energy and they're already sort of presenting why they're going to be so good. Now, a couple of things if they do create those it gives them the ability to go direct to these businesses and so not give all these reserves to the bank and then say hey you know lend them out so that's where i think there's going to be a lot of tension between the, the banks who you know they're corrupt and whatnot all sorts of fireworks are going to happen there um but then just talking about how bad bitcoin is for the environment and it doesn't do anything useful so we need to crack down on them blah 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 now all the research shows that you know, Bitcoin does use a lot of energy, but it all comes from uh, either renewables or spare surplus capacity that would otherwise go to waste. So very little is coming from you know coal power plants because it's just not economically viable to do that. So I think this is going to be absolutely a, a talking point, a debate. The US coming out today and saying El Salvador accepting this as a currency is dangerous for the whole financial system. And so the countries that have got nothing to lose, they're going to adopt it. And then we're going to see these with all the power that are going to try and talk it down and, you know, expect a false flag of some sort, I'd, I'd say. Um, but, yeah, watch that space. And for me, I think it underscores this, that the evolution of the financial system is going to happen, right, from where we are. Because what we've got at the May today is unsustainable, right? The question is, what are the, what's the playbook, Right? How does the reset happen? Where does it where does it end up? Right? I think it's a genuine open question at the moment, but you can see how parties are being positioned for different solutions. And for me, the key question is how much control will governments want and will central banks want for the financial system ahead, right? Versus how much control should they be allowed to have? And of course the thing about the um, you know, the crypto world is that the decentral in the decentralized world it's a different mode of operation right whereas what the central banks are trying to do is to reimpose in the digital space the same controls that they have in the uh, you know space at the moment um, that's really the heart of the debate and at the moment i think there's a battle for hearts and minds either side of that debate right the question is ultimately can the two coexist or will ultimately one win out that for me is the really you know big strategic question which we won't answer today but boy it'll be interesting to watch it as it evolves yeah and i think you're keen to do a show on that martin um on your channel and i'll mm. probably upload it to mine afterwards at some point as well but i think that'd be good for the audience um and particularly for your viewers that might not be crypto savvy to dive into the the technical sort of aspects of how well how would a wallet work with a central bank digital currency yeah. that's monitoring everything yeah. versus how wallets work on bitcoin or ethereum or whatnot as well yeah so. no, that will be a great um a great show to do so uh we should try and make that happen on dfa and because uh, because there, there there are more people now asking more of the right questions right but often it's hard to get coherent answers so it would be good to explore that
Absolutely. We'll uh, we'll make that happen soon. And guys, I hope you've appreciated this. Again, another really enjoyable enjoyable episode. Uh, love chatting with you, Martin. So thanks once again. Great. Enjoyed talking with you. Take care. Cheers, guys.